And tonight, we have Scott. Am I on? Am I loud? No. Are we getting there? There we go. It's kind of weird not holding one of these. <laughs> Maybe I'll just shut it off and hold it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> it's a comfort thing. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta get out of my comfort zone. <laughs> what do I do with these things? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a fiddle toy, didn't you? All right. Before I started, whoa! Justin's new at me at this. Okay, before I started, I wanted to start. Uh, Mentioned two things about uh, about Andrew with with his uh, opening moments. Uh, a couple of things that I noticed right away. Um, the first thing was that he, um, when he addressed mom and dad, about and I'm sure he knew that was going to be emotional, and he did it anyways. That was excellent. He, you know, nervous, and then showing emotions on top of being nervous is like double dose but he went and did it anyway so that was that was great and then um, the next part was when he I don't know how many others noticed but when he started tried to start off it wasn't going real well at the beginning so but I don't know how many of you noticed that he actually prayed and boom like there was a switch right there Instant answer to prayer. So that was uh, a couple of things I wanted to uh, say that they were very commendable. That was, that was uh, excellent. So I'm going to pick off, pick up, where I left <laughs> off. I'm not going to pick anybody off. Maybe, I don't know, if she gets rowdy, maybe. <laughs> um, pick up where I left off, left off last year with my message about what Sukkot is a type and shadow of. But first, I needed to expand, because the Holy Spirit led me to expand on uh, something that Tim had mentioned first. And I don't know if I can even call it a rabbit trail, because I haven't actually started yet. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's technically a rabbit trail or something shiny, as some of us like to say. <laughs> Ooh, something shiny. <laughs> and I head off that way. Difficult in my line of work to stay away from things that are shiny. <laughs> um, but so this is more of like an on-ramp than a rabbit trail. So the, what I wanted to address, what Tim mentioned, was comfort zones. And uh, comfort zones are very dangerous. I know a lot of you like, what? It's only a comfort zone. It's not a big deal. It's just a little comfort zone. And that's exactly why they're so dangerous. Because um, the comfort zones, believe it or not, come from the enemy. And uh, it's like, no, 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 God loves me so much. He gave me this comfy, pl comfy place so I'd feel good, you know? No, 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 it's, no, he didn't do that to you. If there's anybody in this building that knows anything about comfort zones, it's me. Comfort zones controlled my life for 25 plus years because if you aren't actively pushing your comfort zones out, they're closing in on you. The borders of your comfort zone are closing in on you, and that's how I know that they are of the enemy. That's right. My comfort zones went from, I'm not comfortable going over there, to I'm not comfortable driving that far, to I'm not comfortable going to school, to I'm just comfortable if I stay home. And then it had to be, OK, I'm home, but now I need this type of food in the house, or drink, or some type of candy, or gum. That, and so comfort zones, I wasn't pushing them, so they got smaller and smaller and smaller, and my comfort zones became my prison. And they're saying, man, Scott, you really stink at this joyful celebration thing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'd like to say that once I got born again, that God just said, you know, come here, son. You're mine now. We were all out of that. It's, you don't have to live like that. Let's go. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen that way. <laughs> he can, but he didn't with me. Um, the, uh, but he gave me a really neat analogy of how it really worked for me. And that was that Abba sits like a needle 
on the horizon. Now, when he's given me this last night, I was like, a needle on the horizon. It's like, well, horizons are kind of like tomorrow, but even worse, because at least with it's tomorrow, you can get one second away, and then it disappears again. But a horizon is always way out there. And no matter where you're traveling, it's always way out there. You never get any closer to the horizon. So I was like, what do you mean you're like a needle on the horizon? And what he said was, well, what is a horizon? Horizon's not at the beach, the edge way out there, up in the mountains, as far as you can see. He said, what's a horizon? It's as far as you can see. So how far can you see yourself? It's, it's not the distance, it's an internal thing. That's right. That's right. So what's your horizon? And my horizon was I couldn't see myself sitting through class without being extremely nervous. I couldn't see myself traveling down the highway without having issues. I couldn't see myself less and less and less. So your horizon is really where you see yourself. So you need to ask yourself, where do I see myself? And that's that's where your real, where the needle is going to be, is not on the physical horizon because you'd never ever get there. Then God is the needle, will be just outside of your horizon. So you can see yourself, maybe, I use Desi for a minute, but you can see yourself speaking in front of this many people. Or can you see yourself speaking in front of 2,000 people? So that would be Desi's border. You know, so right now she can see herself preaching to 50 people. So then she's got to push. And so God's sitting out there, sitting at, as the needle at 75 people. And so when Desi pushes her borders to preach to 75 people, now she reaches God with her, with her border. And so the, but, uh, so what happened with me was God sitting out there as a needle on the horizon, on my horizon. And when I pushed my, the border of my comfort zone towards him, the instant I touched him with my border, boom, the balloon of my comfort zone blew apart. And so, and because of that, you know, glory to God, I'm free from all the chains of anxiety that ever bound me. And uh, you know, so that... Big time praise for that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I wouldn't be up here, even though my heart's beating like crazy for some reason. I don't know why. But <laughs> this happens even when I'm familiar with stuff. So I don't pay attention to that, though. My heart's not in control. <laughs> so I told you I'd get a little better at this, being a little bit more joyful thing now. So getting better, but... <laughs> So now on to where I left off last year. And like Dad was saying for, through these, uh, through these before, uh, before Sukkot even started and then throughout, he's been talking about that each one of the leaders, plus one, has been building upon the last person's, uh, what they've been teaching. And knowing what Abba had already put in me, what I was going to talk about tonight was that I could see that they didn't even know what they're, they didn't even know what they're talking about, but they didn't know what they're talking about, but they're talking into my sermon as well. So they are speaking things into the future without even knowing what was going on. So we were building upon the last one, but also feeding the one that's out front too. So they did know what they were talking about though. <laughs> so they, um, let's see. So they were also speaking into my my teaching. Um, Sukkot is a picture of a Jewish wedding. And that's where the, the bride and the groom celebrate for seven days. Right. It's a big wedding celebration. I can't imagine how much those cost. <laughs> but it, they've been going on since the time of Yeshua. That, and it's the seven day feast that he, where he changed the water into wine. Yeah. So they, they celebrate under a wedding canopy or the hoopah. And that hoopah is a symbol of a temporary dwelling place of a, a, um, a type and shadow of the permanent dwelling place that they're going to have once they 
leave the wedding celebration, they're going to go start and grow their, uh, grow their family and their relationship together. So that's what the, the sukkah represents. It's, it's the wedding canopy. And it's the, 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 um, the groom that's coming in is Yeshua. And so this is our, every year remember it, but it's, it's the types and shadows of the Jewish wedding ceremony is they're really close to what's going on with uh, Yeshua. And before this even started, Dad said that seven days of joy, joy celebration is the beginning or preparation for an eternity with Abba. That sounds like a marriage to me. Marriages are supposed to last forever. Uh, not to condemn anybody whose marriage didn't last forever or anything like that. I just wanted to say that you know they're meant to last forever. And uh, you know Abba doesn't like divorce. Marriage is supposed to be like cherry of mine, where we get it right from the first time, and and that's it. So, not that ours is perfect, but it's growing. So that's excellent. And that's part, of, that's part of the marriage. You know, everything, every, continuous growth. So it gets better and better all the time. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at a couple of the parallels for the Sukkot and the Jewish wedding. I think I mentioned some already. Um, first, the bride, the groom finds his bride. He falls in love with her. Then he goes off for a long time to prepare a place for her. And then he returns to her. And there's this great celebration for seven days. And then they go off to live out their marriage. And that's why I started to write. And then Holy Spirit arrested my thinking when I wrote that. And I went, I just couldn't imagine Yeshua coming and seeking out a bride and someone to scouting around more or less. You know, is that one good? Is that one good? You know, it's like, no, it just, it just didn't fit very good. And that's more of an illustration came on that one. And that is that um, the... What Abba showed me is that it's more of an arranged marriage where the, the father chooses the bride for his son. And we were chosen by God to be the bride of Yeshua. Yeah. So the, the um, appears to be the part that I didn't type up. <laughs> <laughs> what, so what... Um, what Yeshua ended up being with the, it's kind of a strange situation how it works because the father chose the bride for the son, but the dowry for the bride was the groom. Mm -hmm. So the groom paid for his own bride with his own life. So that was something he dropped into me and I spent a while looking up on the internet how to spell dowry. <laughs> <laughs> spell check has no clue what dowry is. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> it wasn't working for me. It's, I can't even remember what it was. D-O-W-R-Y, I think it was. Dowry. So... Um, so who was thinking about, or who was talking about my teachings throughout the week? Tim started it off talking about comfort zones. And when you get married, you have to get rid of your comfort zones. Because if you try to keep your own comfort zones, it's just going to mess things up. The, the marriage is going to suffer a lot if you need to keep your own place and, and uh, have your own things that you do and the other person can't have anything to do with it. Um, you can't be the master of your own, your own, uh, your own uh, marriage. There has to be a two-part, two-way thing to go. And the same with Yeshua is that, you know, we can't control this thing. He's the one in control. When we get married to Yeshua, we have to let go of our comfort zones and let him be the one who's ruling the relationship. It is a one-way relationship, more or less that way. <laughs> but we do have to give in to uh, what he says to do. So then uh, Jesse talked about the progression into family from being, um, being single in, the, in Egypt and then corporate 
in, in the wilderness and in, into family <clears throat> when they reach the promised land. And that also is very good. Uh, it's very important uh, to being in a good marriage is you need to become family. Uh, you need to live with the other person in mind constantly because you're not your own anymore. Then Sherry went and she was talking about dwelling. Uh, you need to make, it, you, quotes from Sherry, uh, you need to make a choice to dwell in Abba every day. And so it is to be in a good marriage. You need to choose to live a married life every day. You can choose to live as a single person and uh, with, when your will and not, let me try this again. You can choose to live as a single person when you're not the, when you're not, and that will greatly impact the unity of that marriage. So just like with Yeshua, when we get married to Yeshua, if we choose to live like we're not married to him, it's really going to impact that relationship. So that, that would have a, a huge impact on the unity of that relationship. You can't live like that because you're not your own anymore. Then Jordan moved in and she said, letting go of the things of the past. We can't look back at the leeks and onions of our past and expect to move forward in any relationship. And so it is with us with Yeshua. We can't look back at what we used to do. And oh, it was so fun when I hung out with my friends and we did all this bad stuff. And That's not going to do anything for the relationship. So if you keep looking back at the leeks and onions and expect to move forward in the relationship that you've entered into, um, that's not going to work. When we, when we leave Egypt, we need to travel light. We can't take all the luggage that we had with us and carry it with us. We've got we to gotta leave the luggage behind, take all the good stuff with you, but leave all that old junk in the past, of your past behind you because you're not your own anymore. And then Andrew came in, and he says, is our God ourselves? If we enter into a relationship and we keep ourselves as the only leader in that relationship, not only is that relationship going to suffer, but it isn't even really a relationship. If you're the leader in it, it's more of a dictatorship. You cannot be the sole leader in a relationship because you're not your own anymore. When Dad came in, and he says that we're Egyptian by birth and Israeli by choice. Every day, every moment, we have a choice to walk through life like we're single or realize that we are not our own anymore and we were bought with a price. That's the dowry I mentioned. And that price was the life of Yeshua. And we were bought with an awesome price to be the bride of Christ. The Feast of Tabernacles is the wedding rehearsal. It's a time of great joy because of what we are anticipating for the future and realizing, coming to the realization of our marriage to the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. And that's what Sukkot's about. It's about coming in, realizing this is a wedding celebration, and getting ready to be what we need to be with him, walking out our lives as married people because we're married to Yeshua. And thinking about that in everything we do and everything that we talk about and people that we meet, you know. Like when I meet people, it's like, this is my wife, Sherry. You know, and pictures up from the, my, uh, my office and stuff, and people come in, and, yeah, that's my wife. A lot of them know, them, know her because we're, we both work together, but we need to be like that with Yeshua, too. This is my Lord, and, you know, I am one with him, and we need to be like that through everything that we do. So look at somebody and say that you're not your own anymore. <laughs> Amen? Amen. All right.
It's about dwelling. It's not about an event. It's not about a miracle. It's, yeah, and that's why I think y'all may say we need to do it for seven days, is to get into our senses that the Christian journey is not about events, and it's not about miracles, but it's about dwelling continually with Yahweh. He invited us to be part of his family on his journey. But I, I really got a focus when Tim was talking about the baggage that we carry, and I think at least one or two others of you talked somewhere about baggage. I'm sure you must have been talking about stepping out of the mountains. And if you get the picture right, that there was uh, miracle after miracle after miracle happening in Egypt to drive the Egyptians to one point. And that was a point where they said, okay, you can go in the wilderness. We're going to let you go with this bondage. And when it came, it, it came suddenly. Come on, breakthrough is always coming. Suddenly. Right. You might be working and working and working. And somewhere in that process, I'm sure they all got tired of uh, flies and, and cattle disease and water turning to blood and frogs, frogs, and frogs and darkness. I mean, even the, even the people of God were getting tired of this journey because it seemed like it was never going to end. And now comes the, the last of the plagues when the firstborn is going to be slain. The firstborn of everything. People, cattle, all over the region. And I can see a sense of fear and apprehension among the Israelis. The Jewish people, they're thinking, you know, man, if Pharaoh was mad before, what's he going to be like now? You know, this is, and, and there's people like that, by the way, with the devil. I don't want to do anything to get the devil mad. Well, okay. Hate you more than it already does because you're a reflection of your body. And, and so that night when they uh, when they were ready to go, it was quick. You notice they were told to, to eat the Passover with their, their garments on around them, ready to go. And the image is of a of a quick leaving. And we we don't quite understand that, but I think maybe we can begin to get the picture. If we think somewhat of what's going on in Haiti, those of you who've been to Haiti, this morning we were talking about building a 10 by 10 house. I mean, this is their house. This isn't their tool ship. This isn't their storage ship for extra stuff. This is all they have in life is 10 by 10 uh, and maybe one chair, maybe a wood bed, no mattress, but the wood bed Looks, would be more the size of a child's bed, and you can't buy children and two adults and say, you know, what do you do? Rotate the bed at night, or how does that work? And uh, when a flood comes, and people say, well, they lost everything they had. Well, everything they had wasn't much. You know, everything they had was no appliances, just maybe one little cooking pot, maybe, maybe one or two little. Uh, whatever things you call it, the plates to eat on. But it, it didn't take much to lose everything because it didn't come. Now here's the challenge. I want to give you a picture, and then we'll wrap this up real close because I think this picture is going to blaze in here about the challenge we have as Christians. We're going to go out, and we're going to leave Egypt behind, and we're going to head out to a promise land, but what do we do? We call up the moving company and an 18 wheeler backs up. Come on. An 18 wheeler backs up. I remember when we left uh, Hubbardston and we were moving to Pittsburgh and I, uh, the people who sold us a house were still living in it. That was our agreement with them. They could live into it, in it after we bought it for three months. But I said, the condition is I want your garage. If you've got a garage downstairs, I want access to it. Well, it was our garage because now we're in the house. I said, just, just give me the access to there, because I want to start bringing stuff from Hubbard to over. Oh, I don't want to leave this to the end. And so, you know, we had a big trailer in the back of uh, Delta's uh, expedition. And every time we came from Hubbard to Litchburg, we brought another load. And I'd go open the, the garage, and I'd start stacking this stuff in. And it's, it's all along the wall, and then up to the ceiling, and then another rope, 
and I put the seal in and another rock. And I remember one time, uh, you know, the, the people that were living there, the guy comes down to this and he says to me, wow, you have a lot of stuff. And I said, you haven't seen the furniture yet. <laughs> there wasn't a stick of furniture in there. We filled up the entire two-car garage with boxes. Boxes of books, boxes of clothes, boxes of this, boxes of boxes of that, boxes of... You know, it was like one of those clown cars. <laughs> you know, where the Volkswagen pulls up and 20 people get out of it. And you say, how did they get in? It's like, as, as it was all there, I'm thinking, how, how did that all fit in our house in Hunters? Where was it coming from? Somebody bringing it up in the basement, you know? But I packed boxes and carry boxes, and packed boxes and carry boxes. In fact, we filled that whole downstairs with boxes. My goodness, what would happen if we got a, you know, a movie there? And you know, then we started moving up the furniture. You know, the house is bigger than we had, but, but even at that, I'm walking around saying, where on earth did all this furniture fit? <laughs> that happens. Well, we got some more furniture. I, you know, we buy books, and so I started buying bookcases at the Salvation Army. I don't know, I must have bought 10 bookcases. We've got bookcases now all over the place and everything like that. But we, we in all our movie, all our movie, <laughs> We've never, uh, we, we've never hired a living man because my comment was, why pay them a lot of money to do when I can get some friends together and we can do it again? You know, so I, I'm, I'm a great new hall But I've often wondered, and, and now I wonder it even more, you know, should the Lord tarry and, and God says, hey, I've got a bigger place for you. <laughs> we're going to move. Well, this time we're going to get a, an 18-wheeler. But I don't think an 18-wheeler can fit all of our furniture. Come on, we have a big house. You know, and, and it, it's like, it, it is, you know, I usually run the calls two at a time, and that, all my life, it was like, get to the same day and have someone driving because it got two loads at least of the biggest you haul and, and, you know, I, I'm not saying that in a, in a critical way. I'm certainly not saying that probably. What I'm saying is that, that my life in the natural, and our life in the natural, has been a life like maybe yours has. Is that when you move, you carry things. Back up the truck, pack it all. Including boxes that you never unpacked in the last movie. You don't even know what's in them. <laughs> You know, but they must be important because you brought them from the previous movie. And, and the Lord is dealing with all of us about the things that we do in the natural as reflections of what is possible in the spiritual that you may need to look at. Right. Now, I, I had an earthly father. Uh, if you heard my stories about him, I don't want to get into those. I mean, he and I didn't have a particularly uh, good relationship. But, you know, he taught me something that if I had learned it at a spiritual level, I think I would have been spiritually far ahead of the game uh, than I was by not learning it. My, my dad was born again for later in life. And I certainly was in no position to say, God, my father is teaching me a spiritual lesson that you see. I only saw it in the natural. He was his wife. He was an army officer, so we knew him in two or three years. And I went to, I don't know, eight, nine schools before I graduated from high school, all over the world. And, and so we, we moved. And every time it came time to move, my father would come into the bedroom and he'd put down a footlocker. Do you know what a footlocker is? An army footlocker? And he would say to me, son, whatever you can fit in there, that's what you can take. Now, I didn't count my clothes. I could take my clothes. And in a lot of our moves, we, we couldn't even take our furniture. Because if you're going overseas, the only thing take the furniture for you, they're gonna, they're gonna let you borrow some from them while you're there, hardly as you want it. But you know, like any other young boy, I had toys. And, and I can remember, you know, that I've got a foot ladder that's about this this long, and have this wide, and about this tall. And Daddy said, all the books, all the toys, all the comic books, I was a great comic book reader, you know, all, all the games, everything. 
one that's got to fit in that. Because if you can't fit it, you can't take it. And, and so I was forced to make choices. What is of value to me? So that in my, my journey through the, my military years growing up, uh, I was constantly making choices. I, I remember one time we were in Colorado, Pennsylvania, and I got into making model ships, plastic model ships. If you could put them together, glue them, and paint them, and everyone came time to, to move. There's no way I must have had a dozen model ships that I had made during my years there. And it's like, you're not taking models. You know, my model ships are so special to me. It's amazing when you're down to a footlock of how unspecial something can become. <laughs> It's like, no, I have things that are more valuable than those model ships. So I gave them away to some of my friends. Here you want bought the ships, gave them away. And we, we became uh, trained to be givers. Okay? We also became uh, trained to think of valuable things in small sizes. You know, don't supersize it, because I got to get it eventually into my foot locker if I want to go. Now, you know, as, as, as life went on, and I went to, uh, to college. Uh, that was good training, because when I went to college, I, again, I was allowed one footlocker to take to college with me. My parents were in Germany at the time, so I thought, run home on the weekend and bring more stuff. So, you know, you see people going to college these days with you home parents. You know? <laughs> they got the refrigerators, they got the this, and everything else, they're home in the college. It's like, no, no, I had a, I had a footlocker that flew into from Germany to go to college. And that developed a, a lifestyle of having to evaluate it. Now, here's the point of what I'm, I'm trying to create a picture for. If, if you were to say to me, well, well Pastor, what happened to that football? Well, over the years, that football got smaller and smaller. As I would say, look, I, I, do I need everything that's in the football? Yeah, well, some of it's childish things. I don't need childish games. When I was a child, I felt like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And so my foot locker now is a cardboard box that's about this size and this deep. That's the only thing that I have left of all those years uh, from college and before. Every, every few minutes, yeah, especially if you tap the moon. And, you know, and I have days, I go and I, I look through, well, why did I keep this letter? Or why did I keep this thing here? Or why did I keep this kazoo or harmonica? I kept a harmonica for, in there. You know, for years, I, I don't think it's in the box anymore. I think the harmonica went. I gave it to a grandchild or something somewhere. I gave it away. But, but it's like, here's this, this little box of what would be called my earthly possessions. Now, not that I don't have lots of possessions now, but in terms of possessions for my past. And so the, it, it had to be maybe three or four weeks ago, maybe, maybe six. I, I, I don't know if you can tell me that one when it comes to that. I was down in our basement uh, cleaning up our cabinets, which had tons of them. We got books, we got this. You know, with all the children we had, we got art supplies that kind of got over the You know, Christmas presents that never got over Give Jordan one that I gave her two years earlier. And she said, Dad, this is what you gave me two years ago. I said, You didn't use it, so I'm going to wrap it. <laughs>
And, and so I thought, you know, it's got to have been years and years and years since I, I looked in that box. I did, like I say, it's now down in this little box. So I open the box, and there's things in there. What on earth did I keep them for? You know, I, I have a biology paper that I did where I drew out all different kinds of uh, biological specimens. It's really good, considering I was only in seventh grade. I do say so myself. I, I think I have a term paper on the Habsburg dynasty of uh, <laughs> Central Europe before World War I. I know you all would think that would be very interesting to read. Well, internet, but I don't know if anyone else. You know, and, and I'm looking at it, and, and, and an amazing discovery, because, you know, for years and years and years, when I looked at that, there was a pullback. There was, ah, I remember when. Oh, I remember that. Oh, I remember. I don't even have my yearbooks, by the way. I got rid of all those things. Too. But I, I, I remember. And this time, when I opened it up, all I could wonder was, what is the value of that? You see, it, it's baggage for the That's not me. That, that, that young man is long gone. <laughs> Amen. And Holy Spirit said to me that if you had treated the rest of your life, with the same diligence with which you weeded out physical things from your life. You wouldn't have to deal with issues that you deal with as an adult. See, we're, we're in the wilderness on our way to a higher level, and, and I'm not speaking to you children now, I'm speaking to you adults. And some of us are carrying far too much baggage for the journey. You know, we, we got suitcases filled with stuff that has no value whatsoever toward the promised land. We got trinkets from our past memories, <coughs> things that once gave us value, that were important to us, that no longer are who you are. Really now, are the Beatles that important? And yet you got your record collection of them. And name your favorite rock and roll group for those old, old enough to remember rock and roll. But, but we keep them, you know, in terms of the, the things of our life, the attitudes of our life. And some of us are lugging around, back up the trailer, loaded up with family traditions that kept our family bound. Why are we trying to carry that into the future? Do we really want to be bound like the things that bound our family? Some of us are carrying uh, trailer loads of attitudes. And it truly does affect our altitude. Because we're trying to go high, but we got all this stuff that we're carrying around, where we get easily offended, where, where things upset us, where we're brittle kinds of people. And yet God wants us to get into the promised land, into a land that's flowing with milk and honey, where all our needs are not there. We don't have anything in the past at all, at all, that is going to help us with the future. Not a thing in the past that's going to be useful for our future. So here we are in Sukkotan, where we're making this journey, and a number of us, of the leaders as they spoke, were talking about a need to let go. Well, now's the time to do that. Yes. Now, you can practice it. Because if you say, oh, that's easy to do, I just let go of that. Well, if you think it's so easy, then, then go home um, this, uh, this week sometime, and take a few hours, and practice it by getting rid of things. Things. Go through your closet and say, I'm going to take out of my closet anything I haven't worn in the past 12 months and give it to the Salvation Army. I, I'm going to look at all my shoes, any shoes I haven't worn in the last 12 months, I'm going to get rid of it. 
Go, go look in some of your, your drawers or boxes where you're storing stuff that you still have from high school. Or things from whatever. Someday I'm going to use that. Well, you've been saying someday for the last 18 years, and you haven't used it yet. Now, I, I suggest, and, and, and I suggest you really do this, because the reason I'm saying if you practice it in the natural is it's too easy to fool yourself that you don't have that problem in the spirit. But if you can't deal with it in the natural, then you're not dealing with it in the spirit. The natural is easier to deal with. The Bible says, for example, how can you say you love God who you haven't seen if you don't love your fellow man who you have seen? So, so what the Bible says very clearly, if I can't love you, then I don't care what I say about loving God, it's not real. That loving my fellow man, my brother and sister in the Lord, loving one another is the only accurate measure of whether you love Yahweh, whether you want the issue. That's what the Bible says. You know, and, and yet Christian, I love God, I love God, I love God, but I'm not loving other people, but I love God. Yeah, but you're not giving the nice to other people, but I love God. And you, you know, who are you to tell me I don't love God? I'm not telling you the Bible's telling you. If you don't love one another, you don't love God. How can you love God whom you have not seen if you cannot love your fellow brother whom you have seen? So your relationships horizontally are the, are the true revelation of where your, where your relationship is uh, with God. Well, it's the same thing in terms of letting go. If you can't let go of earthly things, earthly tangible things, in the natural, then how on earth are you going to think that you're going to know of attitudes that you're carrying with you that will defeat you for the rest of your life? That's a good check. And, and, and I would like to believe that all of you uh, would take advantage of that and come back with a report. You know, Pastor, I tried it and I was amazed at how many things I didn't want to get rid of. Uh, my suspicion is most people won't try. That's a nice illustration, I understand it. But you don't understand it until you actually go through the process of getting rid of things. When we're going in our spiritual journey, is going to require that we get rid of attitudes. And where we go in this nation, you and I, as we live out the years till Yeshua returns, uh, we're going to be in a place where we may be forced to give up. But if we haven't learned how to do that, then our attitude's going to get in the way. You know, you came into the world with nothing, you're going to go out of the world with nothing. What are you saving it for? Well, what are you saving the old man for? Paul keeps talking about that, doesn't he? So what was the point of Sukkot? The point of Sukkot was this. It is very easy for God to get the people out of Egypt. It's very hard to get Egypt out of the people. It's very easy for God to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Yeshua is, is Lord, you will be saved. It's very easy for God to get, uh, get you know, the, you out of the world into salvation. And, and that's a transaction that the devil cannot stop. But it's very challenging for God himself to get the world out of you. He can get you out of the world in a moment. In fact, the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be aware, present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You know, the devil can't stop that at all. So if you step out of your earth suit, you're present with the Lord. Glory to God, hallelujah. But how do we get that, that which is of the world out of the you and me? And that's our job. That's our job to begin saying, I, I don't need that anymore. 
to try to prove to the world who I am anymore. I didn't need to carry uh, a flesh that's out of control anymore. And, and so we can come to a point where we begin unpacking for the road ahead. For the road ahead. Now, where we're going is going to require that we travel right. We're going to have to travel right. Amen? I, I think it's Billy Britt who, who, who said that when you go to Israel, you know, put all your clothes in. Some be said, have to start putting your clothes in the suitcase you want to take and everything. And then three days before you're going to go, open your suitcase and take half of it out. You know, you're, not, you're not really going to need that. Well, in the same thing where we're traveling spiritually, you're not going to need the things you think you need. Glory to God. You're going to find what you need is, is courage. You need faith. You need to have removed fear out of your life. None of the things that you have built up in terms of self-image matter when you've sunk yourself out to Yeshua's image. So where are we now, church, in our journey? Where we are is we're in the circle. Come on. We're in the circle, which means we've left Egypt. We're in this experience of, gee, we've been here for a while, and we're, we're going to go, to go, we're remembering that everything's temporary. God wants to shift us into walking in the kingdom of God. And once we're walking into the kingdom of God, nothing of us matters anymore. But rather, it is the world around us. Amen. So we can enjoy the journey, and it's going to be a lot easier if you want back. And that, we get into one last illustration. I took a group of uh, teenagers from my Washington. And uh, I used to take a couple times in the summer take our youth group climbing. And this particular year, uh, you know, we had a, a, a sizable group of teenage boys and girls who were headed up the mountain and spending a night camping out in top of Inver Bay. And as opposed to Jacora or other mountains where we go up and come down on the same day, this one we were leaving on Friday, right after school, headed up there, maybe halfway up on Washington, Saturday. Finish the rest of the climb to Washington and then come all the way down, and then I could be back in the church on Sunday. So we're about halfway up to our destination on Mount Washington, and there's a couple of girls there who have got, I mean, they're just like running the past time. They got their backpacks, they all have backpacks, and, and they're like, we can't go on, we can't go on. It's like, well, you gotta go on. I mean, I don't care if you can or can't, you have to. <laughs> I, I can't send you back down the trail. It's going to be dark in a couple of hours. I can't send you back down the trail. I can't leave you here. I can't say to the whole group, well, you know, these two girls can't go, so I guess we're all stuck here. You know? And so I, I got one of the bigger boys and I said, listen, you grab her pack and I'll take that one's back and we'll carry the pass. So the girls thought that was a pretty good idea. I think they had that actually been three girls that so they scamper off. You know, they're all we should have this pack. I don't know what this pack is. It must be the world You know, because this pack is heavier than my pack. He got a bunch of you know, top necks and lots of stuff. So I'm not the biggest guy. I'm the man who loves you this pack. And the other guys are carrying the other packs. And you know, we get up the top of this ravine and it's probably me because I'm tougher than that. And then I sit down. Anybody want some soda? And she opens a pack and there had to be, you know, it had to be stuffed with soda cans. <laughs> I looked at her and said, you were having me carry soda cans up the, up the mountain? <laughs> you know, shame on you. Now that never happened to me again, shame on me. I learned. Boy, after that, I don't care who was there, I, I learned. You know, before you even start up the mountain, what's in your pack? Dump the kids on a 10 day bicycle trip. And I said, what's ever in your sleeping bag, dump it out. Because I told them they had to backpack everything they carried, but we would take their sleeping bags in the car, the big station wagon. And when I started picking up sleep, sleeping bags, they were suspiciously. <laughs> And I found curling irons stuck in there and all kinds of things. So I, I said, 
Living God, 